Welcome back to this I-24 News Evening Edition. This is One on One. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Ambassador Dennis Ross, today a distinguished fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Before his post there, Ross served as Special Assistant to U.S. President Barack Obama and National Security Council Director and Special Advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Let's see what he has to say. Mr. Ross, thank you very much for giving us this interview for I-24 News. Sure. Um, I will start with you with the Israeli-Palestinian process. Back then, um, the Palestinians uh, blamed you for not being, let's say, fair enough towards them. And the Israelis blamed you for being too pro-Palestinian. I must have been doing something right. <laughs> Correct. Now when you're looking 2014 at the new process, yeah. can you put point a finger and say you or you or both of you are the ones to blame? You know, look, I think it's always, uh, I think, a kind of game to determine who's responsible, who's to blame. I think at the end of the day, if we don't have an agreement, then it should become clear why we didn't have an agreement. Uh, I tried to say in the year 2000 that we didn't have an agreement because at that point Arafat wasn't willing or capable of doing what was necessary. Today there's a, a process going on. It is now a process being shaped largely by an effort by the Secretary of State to produce what would be an American basis for negotiations, but one where in a sense, on the key issues, principles will be identified to try to resolve those issues, and then the details will be worked out in negotiations. Now, how each side is going to respond to that will determine, are we going to make headway? Is there going to be progress? Is there going to be an agreement? And if it becomes clear that one side isn't willing to accept it, or both sides aren't willing to accept it, then you'll be able to make a judgment at that point. I don't think you can make a judgment right now. I think right now, there's a pretty intense process going on that the Secretary of State is, is leading. He's obviously going through what are many of the core issues, uh, and it's producing, I think, on each side an effort, some unease on each side. That's to be expected, but I don't think we can make a judgment yet about is this process going to succeed, is it going to fail, and if it does, what's the reason for either the success or the failure? It seems, you know, when I'm looking back, and it seems that uh, these both sides know a lot about talking, but not about actually implementing and acting. Because if we're looking at the White Plant Plantation, if we're looking at the Oslo Accords, if mm -hmm. we're looking at, you know, countless uh, numbers of trying to reach an agreement, it seems that both sides don't have, let's say, brave leadership to actually take a decision and say, this time, we're going to make it. And it seems that John Kerry is not willing to hear neither of the sides this time and say, you're going to sit down until you're going to reach something and implement it. Well, I think even here, it's too soon to know that as well. Let's assume that Secretary Kerry succeeds in presenting uh, an American proposal for the key principles on and how we're going to proceed and outlines the principles for borders, the principles for security, the principles for refugees, the principles for Jerusalem, and the two sides will now begin to discuss how they're going to try to reach an agreement based on those principles. Well, that still won't be implementation. That'll be a discussion. And one of, the, one of the challenges, I think you're putting your finger on something important. Both publics disbelieve today that the other is committed to two states. So Israelis look at Palestinians and say they're not really committed to a two-state outcome. And Palestinians look at Israelis and say they're not really committed to a two-state outcome. And each side can tell themselves a story about why what they feel is true. So even if we get a, a breakthrough in the sense that Secretary Kerry succeeds in putting something down on the table. Both sides decide that they will embrace it with some reservations and proceed to negotiate. 
if that negotiating process, even at that point, is not accompanied by both sides taking actions, whether it's to implement parts of an understanding or it's just to demonstrate that they're quite serious about addressing the concerns of the other, then it's going to be difficult even then to say that you have changed things in any meaningful way. You know, the Palestinians are saying that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is not the one that they can do or reach an agreement with, and the Israelis are saying that Abu Mazen is not a partner. Can these two actually reach an agreement? Do you think that they are brave enough? That they, Do you think that there are enough leaders to actually sit down and say, that's it? If you ask me, I think they're both capable of doing it. I do think they are. But I also think that it's going to be very important, as I said, even if we get a breakthrough, which is still a big question mark, even if we get a breakthrough, there has to be a reality on the ground that reflects a breakthrough. Palestinians will look at Israelis, and if they're building in what they think should be their state, they're going to say, well, you're not really committed. And Israelis will look at Palestinians and will say, if Israel doesn't even appear on a Palestinian map, or if incitement continues as it is, they say, it's clear you're not, it's not for real. So there's going to have to be not just what you agreed to talk about. Uh, even if what you're agreeing to talk about is within a very narrow boundary, in effect, that it tells you, all right, the gap, say, on what borders are going to be is shrunk to a point where we can now find a way to bridge it. Or that the principles on security are now sufficiently well understood that we can implement or we can, we can work out the details of what an agreement will be that we can then implement. And the same on refugees, and maybe even the same on Jerusalem. All and that needs to take place. Sorry? About the settlers? Do yes. you think that Israel will be able to agree to evacuate, let's say, 100,000 settlers? We're sitting right now in the West Bank. I think that would be a huge task. So the question is this issue. It came up when we were at Camp David. Palestinians actually at Camp David raised the idea that Palestinians out, meaning, I'm sorry, Israelis outside the blocks could stay under Palestinian jurisdiction and law. They raised that as an idea. Now, I assume most Israelis would not want to do that. But there may be some who do. So that could be one way to, to deal with that issue. I want to take you to um, the Iranian uh, issue and yeah. the deal. Um, it seems that in a bit I will speak about the foreign policy of uh, President Barack Obama, but it seems that um, all the world is very skeptical about this deal, although they're letting Iran enjoy the benefit of the doubt. Yesterday we heard Barack Obama saying that he is not going to put any more sanctions on Iran. Do you believe in this agreement? Do you believe, really believe that Hassan Rouhani is a person that actually presenting a new approach in Iran? Well, he's certainly presenting a new approach. He's talking about dealing directly with the United States. He's talking about wanting to resolve differences with the rest of the world. That's a very different approach from his predecessor. Because That's a fact. Because with you, they, did, they weren't willing to talk. That's correct. So it's a very, it's a different approach. Now, the question is, what does it mean in practical terms? You're asking, is it a stylistic change or is it a substantive change? And I'm putting it on the table. Is it a charade? I don't think it's a charade, but I think we don't yet know if we're going to be able to see a comprehensive deal. The President of the United States puts it at less than 50-50, less than a 50 percent chance that we're going to see a deal. The Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran says that may even be high, because the key that we're looking at is they are going to have to roll back their nuclear program a, a, a substantial amount. Now, in return, they would get a rollback of sanctions. Whether that's possible remains to be seen. There's no doubt that the pressure brought them to the table. Now, the question is, will these negotiations produce an outcome without ongoing pressure? That's an interesting proposition to test. The administration would argue the structure of the pressure exists intact because the architecture of sanctions hasn't changed. There's been a limited relaxation. There are those who are critics of the deal who will say the psychology of the market is going to change and you'll see the sanctions will collapse of their own weight. Well, that's a proposition. By the way, it hasn't happened yet. Yes, there are delegations going to Tehran, but there's no, been, no new deals have been struck. You know, if Iran is able to export more oil, 
beyond the one million barrels a day, well, then those who claim the psychology of the market is going to produce a certain inevitable result will be right. But if that doesn't take place, those who say that the current pressures you know, are not going to be relaxed will have demonstrated that they were right. Here again, we're at, a, we're at a point where it's too soon to know. I mean, we can watch and see what's going to happen over the next couple months. Do the negotiations produce anything? Uh, do we see companies begin to try to do new deals with the Iranians? Do we see Iran uh, capable of being able to sell more oil? You can actually see whether that's going to happen. Right now, it's not happening. Can Iran, I will add another question, can Iran change, it, change its approach towards Israel? Well, I would say if they want to end their isolation in the world, if they want to have a fully normalized relation, they're going to need to do that at some point. The focus of the negotiations now is only on the nuclear issue. It's not on Iran's behavior in the rest of the region. You know, what they do in Syria, what they do in Lebanon, uh, what they do in Yemen, what they do in Iraq. I mean, at some point, if there's going to be a real change with Iran, it can't just be that there's a deal on the nuclear issue. It's going to have to involve these issues as well. So, you know, it's, it's um, I, I, we hear Benjamin Netanyahu always talking about the Iranian issue and how important it, it is. Do you think that uh, it, and maybe implementing that Israel will act by itself if it's needed? Do you think that it will be a small move that Israel will act? By itself? I think it depends what happens with the negotiations. If the negotiations produce a serious outcome, then it wouldn't be necessary. If they don't produce a serious outcome, then Israel could be facing the reality of Iran becoming a nuclear weapon state. Without the help of the United States? I can conceive of a circumstance where Israel would act without the help of the United States. I can't conceive of a, a circumstance where the United States ends up playing no role. Because there's a question of, if Israel acts militarily, how does it stop? How does it end? You know, what happens uh, in the UN? What happens with ongoing sanctions? Israel's actions that take place without reference to that, uh, in the end, can affect what the Iranians do one time. And you, you can't solve this through, uh, a military, through a military act. No one can destroy Iran's know-how and engineering capability. So you need to be able to sustain sanctions on them even after the fact. This is a continuum. If you have diplomacy and it fails and you use force, you need diplomacy afterwards. So Israel will need the United States at some point. But does Israel need the United States for it to act militarily against Iran? No, it does not. You mentioned uh, Iran intervening in the Syria, in Syria and the crisis in Syria. You know, we're two days uh, after the Remembrance Day of the Holocaust, International Holocaust Day. And what we're seeing in Syria is basically, maybe in 10 years, will be called as the Holocaust of the Syrians. And it seems that the world is actually stopping and not doing anything. And when Barack Obama had the chance to maybe go in and intervene yeah. and stop it, stop the massacre that is happening in Syria, he decided to sit down and talk. Well, A, he never had the chance to go in and stop the massacre unless we're going to, you know, I don't see the United States putting in hundreds you know, but, of thousands but of troops. But drawing a, a red line as a chemical weapon, but right. if it's not chemical weapon, so it's okay, it's, it looks like the whole world didn't learn anything. Well, I, th I think what you're right. There are crimes against humanity that are being committed in Syria today. And it is, unfortunately, uh, a very sad commentary that the international community feels largely powerless to do anything about it. Uh, the slogan, never again, these days looks like it's a slogan and not much more than a slogan. We're about to finish. One advice that you're giving the Palestinians and the Israelis this time in order maybe that this process will end in a good outcome? Well, what I was saying before, whatever the negotiations are, there needs to be a companion piece. We need to find a way to deal with the sources of disbelief. If Israelis don't believe that Palestinians are committed to two states, what can the Palestinians do to show the Israelis we actually are? If the Palestinians believe the Israelis are not committed to two states, 
what is it the Israelis could do to demonstrate to the Palestinians, no, we actually are? There needs to be something in terms of behaviors, not just in terms of the negotiations, that shows something is different this time. Even if there is a breakthrough with what Secretary Kerry is doing, if it is not accompanied by something on the ground or in the behaviors of each side, the disbelief is going to continue to go on. We're in the 20th year of Oslo, and the only way you're going to prove it's different this time is to show something is different, and we're not seeing that yet. Dr. Dennis Ross, thank you very much for you're this welcome. interview. Thank you. That was it for tonight. Tomorrow we will be here at the same time, same place from the Jeff Report. Have a great night.